Welcome to part two of our video series on Tannis. If you haven't seen part one, you might want to go back and check it out. We discussed some amazing aspects of this site and shared some pretty cool experiences we had from our visit there. And while you're at it, please like this video and subscribe to our channel because it really does help us out. Tanis is truly one of the most remarkable sites in all of Egypt, and its rich history has captured people's imaginations for centuries. It saw a unique time in history, and it's definitely a story worth telling. What was once a grandiose city with a magnificent temple now lies in a complete state of ruin. The more we learn about this incredible place, the happier we are that we chose to go see it while we had the chance. And if you ever go to Egypt, we really recommend that you go visit Tanis. This city has been known by many names, and Tanis is actually the name given by the Greeks. The Egyptians called it Janet, and the Arabic name is San al-Hagar, which means the place of the stones. It was built during the Third Intermediate Period, just over 3,000 years ago, during a time when Egypt was greatly divided, and it was thought that the rulers of the north did not possess great wealth or far-reaching power like those of the south. But the archaeological discoveries that were made here show us it was one of the most mighty and powerful cities in Egyptian history. It thrived for more than a thousand years, until it was eventually abandoned and slowly consumed by the desert sands, where it remained buried and lost from history for more than 1,500 years. For centuries, this city was known from the stories written about it in the Old Testament of the Bible, which tell of the miracles that Moses performed before the pharaohs here at the place called the Field of Zoan, and also the tale of the pharaoh Shishak, or Shoshank, who invaded Jerusalem with 60,000 horsemen. Over the generations, the city was thought to have been merely a legend, and many people even doubted that it ever existed. It wasn't until the 1700s that these ruins were rediscovered, but it would still be another 200 years before anybody knew that this was indeed the legendary lost city of Tanis. The site was found in 1722 by Claude Sicard, a French Jesuit priest who had traveled around and studied extensively and actually produced this first known map of Egypt in 1717. In those early days of modern European exploration in Egypt, treasure hunters were rushing to obtain precious ancient artifacts and make a fortune selling them to collectors abroad. Many sites were damaged in this pursuit, and this motivated the development of the official study of Egyptology in order to protect the sites. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte led his famous expedition that was more scientifically organized and carried out the first real survey of Tanis. He wanted to properly study Egyptian history and decipher the ancient hieroglyphic writings. And on this expedition, they found the Rosetta Stone that eventually cracked the code. Further archaeology was done at Tanis in 1825, when another French explorer, Jean-Jacques Raffaud, excavated this exquisite large sphinx statue made of red granite that's been on display at the Louvre in France ever since. In the 1860s, Auguste Mariette, who was the first director of the Department of Antiquities of Egypt, carried out the first major and extensive archaeological work here and excavated many important artifacts, including royal statues and the 400-year stella. In the 1880s, Sir William Flinders Petrie continued with the next serious works on the site and wrote two fascinating books about all the work he accomplished there, link in the description below. He created a detailed plan of the temple complex, cataloged every royal cartouche he found, thoroughly examined the history of many of the stone artifacts, and also discovered a large quantity of fragments of papyrus from the Roman era. Through many years of archaeological work here, there was actually a lot of doubt as to which city this really was. It was thought to possibly be the remains of the Hyksos capital, Avaris, or perhaps P. Ramses, the home city of Ramses the Great. But it wasn't until the late 1930s that the true identity of the lost city would be found. This was in 1939, when the French archaeologist Pierre Monte made an astonishing discovery that would rewrite history and finally identify these ruins as the biblical city of Zoan. Monte had been patiently leading the work here for 11 years, when he made the discovery of a lifetime. Buried beneath the sands, he unearthed a whole complex of royal tombs, 
one of which was completely undisturbed and perfectly preserved. This was only the second intact Egyptian tomb ever found in modern times and was an extremely lucky discovery that every archaeologist can only dream of. It was the royal burial of the 22nd dynasty pharaoh Shoshank II, who was written about in the Bible, and the tomb had not been touched since it was sealed shut almost 3,000 years ago. Pierre Monte literally struck gold. The tomb contains some of the greatest treasures and incredible riches that have ever been found in Egypt. The pharaoh's body lay in this spectacular solid silver coffin, superbly crafted in the shape of the falcon-headed god Horus. It was made from about 90 kilos of silver, which at some points in Egyptian history was even more valuable than gold. Beside the king sat four solid silver canopic jars that held his organs, and on his shoulders lay his beautiful solid gold funerary mask. His body was adorned with exquisite golden bracelets, rings, and amulets inlaid with precious stones like lapis lazuli. Less than a year later, Pierre Monte made another spectacular discovery and found a second completely untouched tomb that contained even greater riches. After tunneling for six days through a huge chunk of an obelisk that sealed off a corridor, he opened the pristine burial of the 21st dynasty pharaoh Susenes I, whose body was sealed in this even more amazing silver coffin that's inlaid with gold. His gold death mask is spectacular and really shows how Egyptians knew how to craft phenomenal pieces of art. His body was also decorated with epic jewelry and his tomb contained many more exquisite gold and silver artifacts. This astonishing treasure trove was a huge surprise that showed that the northern rulers were far more wealthy and powerful than anyone had previously realized. Next, Monte went on to find even a third intact royal tomb with yet another amazing gold death mask and many more precious artifacts of the pharaoh Amenemop. To top it off, several years later he found even a fourth golden funerary mask and the tomb of the general Win Jimbaunjed. All in all, there are 15 tombs discovered in this large burial complex, three of which were completely unlooted and perfectly preserved. The treasures found in there include necklaces, bracelets, rings, gold statuettes, gold and silver bowls, and around 400 Ushabti funerary figurines. These rare discoveries were truly unprecedented because before 1939, there had only been one preserved royal tomb discovered in Egypt, which was that of the world-famous pharaoh Tutankhamun, discovered in 1922 by Howard Carter in the Valley of the Kings. Everyone has heard of his tomb that's world-renowned for containing some of the greatest treasures in history, but most people have no idea that here at Tanis, there were three untouched royal tombs discovered that contained equally incredible riches that perhaps even surpass his. Ironically, people gaze in wonder at his famous mask in the Cairo Museum, not knowing that in the other room, they'd just walk past the incredible treasures that were found here at Tanis. When we spoke to the leading archeologist here at the site, he told us that the golden mask of Susenes would soon replace Tutankhamun's when it's moved to the brand new Grand Egyptian Museum that should be opening sometime in the coming year. Monte's lucky discoveries should have catapulted Tanis into the global limelight as one of the most famous archaeological sites on the planet. But unfortunately, he was very unlucky with his timing, because in 1939, World War II had just begun. And since Hitler and the Great War took over all of the news coverage, these magnificent discoveries here were barely even noticed around the world. And sadly, the lost city quietly slipped out of public awareness and was again lost to history. Today, Tanis still hasn't been fully recognized for just how important it really is, and it seemed to have missed its chance for global fame. Tourists rarely visit here, which is kind of sad, and actually the main reason that most people have ever even heard of Tanis is because of the Indiana Jones movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark. Tanis? Tanis. Nazis have discovered Tanis. One of the possible resting places of the Lost Ark. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant. May have taken the Ark back to the city of Tanis. 
and hidden it in a secret chamber called the Well of Souls. And now you seem to know uh, all about this tennis. No, no, not really. Well, we think the world should know about Tannis, and not just because of the tombs that were found here, but also because of the incredible story of its origins. What makes it so unique is that it actually used to be a completely different city that was moved here from its previous location called Pier Ramses, which was the seat of power of the famous King Ramses the Great of the 19th dynasty. During the New Kingdom era, it was the great capital of the north, but a few hundred years after Ramses' death, its branch of the Nile River had silted up and changed its course, leaving the harbors without access to water, and the people were forced to abandon their city. This was when Egypt entered the Third Intermediate Period, a turbulent time when the country was divided. Piramses was in a grave situation, and it took a powerful king to lead its inhabitants to new beginnings. The pharaoh Susines then ordered that entire city along with its whole population of more than a quarter of a million people, to be moved from its previous location near the modern town of Kantir and brought 20 kilometers or 12 miles to the new site of Tanis. They dismantled all the old Ramesside temples, important buildings and monuments, and then hauled everything here stone by stone to be reassembled here. They transported statues, sphinxes, stelae, and obelisks all in one piece, and the largest obelisk apparently weighed over 200 tons. It must have been an incredible scene to witness, and you can only imagine how much work that must have been, because there's just an immense quantity of stone here that they had to move. Built from the relics of the past, Tanis went on to become a magnificent capital and was at the height of its power for several hundred years. Many have called it the Thebes of the North, and it was the last great city that was built in Egypt before the arrival of Alexander the Great around 700 years later. The 21st and 22nd dynasties ruled here with immense wealth and influence, and the pharaoh Susenes was known as a great ruler who led his people to new beginnings in their time of need. He's been called one of the last true Egyptian pharaohs, and he ruled longer than most other kings in Egypt for almost 50 years. He built a massive stone temple complex here, dedicated to the god Amun, that would have been as magnificent as any of the great temples of Egypt. It was surrounded by a gigantic fortified mud brick wall, and even though it's been heavily eroded by wind and rain for several thousand years, you can still see remnants of it here in the background. The wall was on average 45 feet high, 70 feet thick, and its total perimeter was around 3,400 feet long, and it was built with more than 20 million mud bricks. The outer red section in this diagram is the wall, and the temple in the center was a very large superstructure, some 200 meters or 650 feet long, made of an incredible quantity of huge limestone and granite blocks. Its interior held many beautiful large statues and monuments, and it probably looked very similar to the amazing temple at Karnak, for example. It truly must have been a magnificent sight to see, with its towering walls, tall columns, and gigantic obelisks looming high above. Tanis originally contained at least 17 obelisks, which is more than most sites in Egypt. Karnak, in comparison, had around 20. Sadly, over time, the splendid temple faced the unrelenting forces of earthquakes and vandalism, and was completely destroyed and left in a state of ruin. Visiting the site today is an enchanting experience to wander through this megalithic graveyard and imagine the great city that this used to be. Those early archaeologists must have had a mind-bending time excavating this site from beneath the sands and trying to understand the origins of this immense wasteland of stone. It's so interesting that Tanis was built using the stones from Piramses and that their inscriptions caused people to mix up the two cities for so long. It gets even more intriguing though when we study the origins of Piramses because as it turns out, it was also built using the recycled stones from an even earlier city called Amarna. Amarna was founded by the pharaoh Akhenaten of the 18th dynasty. And if you're familiar with his story, 
you'll know that he led a brief religious revolution away from the traditional pantheon of gods and into monotheism and what he saw as the one true god, Aten. Many people saw this as blasphemy, so when his reign ended and Amarna was abandoned, great efforts were made to erase the heretical city from the memory of Egypt. Ramses demolished a lot of Amarna and brought the stones north to use them to build his own temples, which were then later dismantled to use to build Tanis. It is just such a fascinating story that most of these monuments originated hundreds of years before Tanis even existed. We're always curious about the origins of ancient sites, but this gets confusing because Egyptians reappropriated so many stones from earlier monuments, and things always get mixed up. Artifacts are generally dated based on their inscriptions, but this can be a very problematic method of dating because pharaohs regularly hammered out the names of their predecessors and inscribed their own names instead. This was done throughout Egyptian history, but the most notoriously successful king to ever do it was Ramses. And since the stones of Tanis come from his city, dating them is a bit tricky. He adopted hundreds of artifacts from all around the country that were built long before his time and claimed them as his own. His cartouche is inscribed on countless stones here. It's literally everywhere, but he certainly did not create all of these artifacts. One of the best examples of usurping is on a stone that was used in the construction of the Gateway of Shoshank. We recently learned about this one from Ben's video at Uncharted X. Shout out to Ben. You can see very clearly on the right side of this piece of an obelisk, the surviving remnants of the previous pharaoh's hieroglyphs that Ramses carved out and erased. He then had his own cartouche and inscriptions written over the top instead. For whatever reason though, the earlier writings were not entirely eliminated, and that surviving bird on the right shows clear evidence that Ramses usurped this obelisk that he didn't make. This stone was then ironically later reclaimed and reused again to build this gateway, and this is just how the story of Egypt goes. There are many examples of usurping at Tanis, like on the famous Sphinx in the Louvre for example, which was reclaimed by several different dynasties who carved their names over those of the earlier kings. As well as on the Hyksos Sphinxes in the Cairo Museum, the list goes on and on. In Petrie's book, he discusses this in great detail and shows the plethora of examples of brutal defacement an outright theft performed by later kings on the artifacts of their forefathers. So dating objects from their inscriptions can be a problematic method, because they might only tell us the most recent date that the last person carved their name on them. The origins of many of the stones here at Tanis must come from long before the time of Ramses, and we wonder just how far back does the story go? We're especially curious about the megalithic stones, because there are so many epic ones in Egypt that really stand out and get us thinking about who made them. In particular, Tanis holds the remains of one of the largest megaliths ever made, and we question whether the official story of who made it is true, or if the origins of this city might actually go much further back in time than history tells us. Join us in part three as we explore the mysteries of the incredible megalithic monuments of Tanis and try to uncover their true origins. Thank you guys so much for watching. We originally intended to make only one video on Tanis, but we kept learning more and more about this amazing place, and the video just kept getting longer and longer, so it eventually became three parts. In part three, we dive deep into the largest megalithic achievements of the ancient Egyptians and explore some interesting questions about how they possibly could have transported them, or whether it was even them who did. Stay tuned, and we'll see you in the next video.